So we're going to talk a lot about user testing in the world of APIs. And really the goal here is to improve API usability. And we're going to do that by applying very traditional UX user experience methods to our APIs. And the reason I got here is for a couple of different reasons. Starting with the fact that I've been in a bunch of, I've been in a couple of roles where I've been building out APIs with a team of engineers. And management has told me, oh, you don't need a designer because there's no interface on these APIs. And I was like, yeah, there's no buttons, but an API is an interface. And it would be really great to have somebody who specializes in interfaces to help me design these APIs. And that didn't go so well. So I was like, well, if I can't get a designer onto my team to help build these APIs, then maybe the other strategy is to get the people who build APIs to become designers. So congratulations, you guys are all going to be adding a new skill set to your role today of becoming designers. Uh, and we're going to dive more into what API usability means. And the reason that I talk a lot in here about API usability, it can apply very well to documentation, every single one of these strategies. Uh, but we've all been in situations where we have had to design documentation for really poorly designed APIs. And that's a lot harder than just getting the API right in the first place. So we're going to focus at the beginning on APIs where we're starting more from scratch. Uh, but at the end, we'll go into what to do once you've already got the terrible thing and now you have to make people understand what it is. So don't worry, that part comes too. Uh, the structure we're going to go through is uh, we'll talk a little bit about a broad UX framework. So thinking through the different phases of design that UX designers go through and translating those over into what that means in the phases of designing an API. Uh, we're going to go into sample techniques for each step. Uh, I'll tell a couple of stories and we'll also then, uh, as I said, end with APIs that are already built. So the UX framework that designers generally use is we start from the we don't know what we have to build and we go all the way over to, we know exactly what we've got to build, and now we just need to get everything to be pixel perfect at the end. So discovery is that step of, we think that there's something here that we should build, and we don't really know what it should be. And so you need to figure out, what is something useful that your customers are going to want? And you do a whole bunch of things in discovery phase for that. We then move to taxonomy. Uh, think of it about this like the navigation bar on a website, right? Uh, how do you make sure that people can find what they're looking for? How do you make sure you use words that people understand so that they don't need to call you constantly and ask where things are, right? Discover, it's, it's making the product itself discoverable. Uh, then it's mocking and prototyping. So this is where if we were designing a, a, di a, a visual interface, we would be you know, using our markers and creating wireframes and buttons and saying like, oh, how does this work? And then we'd sketch up, up, up a whole bunch of different ideas. Uh, in the API world, this is about making sure we've got the structures right. We've got the right content in the right place. And then finally, usability is where you really want to dig into those little details, where you want to make sure that everything is exactly the way you want it so that when you start to build, uh, you're building the right thing. And the wonderful part about all of this is the start to finish for an API can be done if you, dedicate, if you and maybe one other person dedicate your time to it for two weeks. You can design a really fantastic API. The most advanced piece of technology you need is a word processor and some index cards. And at the end of the day, once you actually then sit down with your engineering team, uh, or if you are the engineer, once you actually sit down to code out the API, you know the direction you're going in. And as we all know as well, it's a lot easier to know what you're building and build it right the first time than to build it and go back and have to correct it three times later on. So that's the glory of having a UX framework to go through as you build out these APIs. So the first step is discovery. Here, the, the main thing here is, what are we trying to build? Is this actually the right thing to build? Sometimes the question can be, who's actually going to use this? Right? Um, a, a nice point of the morrow is, right? Is your, is your developer going to be really technical? Can they jump in fast? Are they experienced? Is this something they're spending 40 hours a week on? Or is this something where they're hopping in nights and weekends? Because the API you build might actually want to change based on your audience. 
Um, it's also, you know, you want to make sure that you're actually giving them what they need to solve their, the, the use cases that this API is actually searching for. And this applies whether it's an internal API or an external API. If it's an internal API, maybe you're going and talking to the teams that are building out the client side, right? You're doing discovery with them and with the product managers over, and the designers on those teams, right? What is it that you guys are trying to do with this API and you're taking that information back? If it's an external API, you're going to want to go and talk to the actual, your, your customers, but then if they're actually ser serving somebody else, if you can, you want to act, go talk to those end users as well. You want to find out what the full, the full chain is and what everybody wants to know, because if you can see stuff in the designs and in what you're building about the end user that your developers don't see, that means that you are actually going to be creating something so valuable that they're going through your docs and they're like, oh, you can do that too, that's a great idea, that's gonna be so helpful. And all of a sudden you've got a competitive advantage over the rest of the marketplace. So a couple of techniques that you use here, it's generally gonna be very qualitative, right? You're gonna sit down and talk to people. So you wanna use things like interviews, site visits, ethnography, things where you go and you meet people face to face, you see them in their environment, you see what they're doing, what they're trying to achieve, you ask lots of questions and you take really good notes. So a couple of things to think about here, um, the three equations of discovery. One, observation is always better than conversation. Uh, and I'll dig into that in a second. But any time that you can see what somebody's doing or you can observe them doing something is gonna be a lot better for you than if you just talk to them and they say, oh yeah, I really like this stuff. Um, because when you get that kind of answer and you then dig in, like how many times do you actually do it though? How, many, how often are you using this? Like how important is it to you? You're not gonna get back as much detail. The second thing is make sure that you're talking to the developers who are accessing your API as well as those end users, right? Get the full spectrum because the more you know about everybody in the system, the better you're going to be able to build something out that's just right. And finally, look for the point of marginal return. I get a lot of questions of like, how do you know when you've done enough discovery? How do you know when you've done enough UX? And the answer is there's a point where you've talked to somebody and you're like, huh, I learned nothing from that conversation. And if you're at that point, it probably means you've talked to enough other people that you're done. Consider that, you know, hey, great, you, you've gotten what you wanted from this phase and you can move on. So a good example of this over at Spot Hero <coughs> is that uh, our system had it set up where we had license plates living in one place and we had cars with like make, model, year, and color living somewhere else. And this is because in our system, we use license plates for some things and we use car, make, and model for other things and they had nothing to do with each other. But we started talking to our users and we started talking, you know, thinking about building out our APIs for our partners and discovered that this is not how the world works. You can't just like trade out your license plate every time you go out, like you trade out your shirt because you want to wear a different color. Cars and license plates are tied very closely together. So this made us realize that we actually had to build, even though in our world, we didn't really care if they were tied together, we had to build out a system where these things were related because otherwise customers were getting confused as to why they could change out their license plate on the car that was there, because that's not how the world works. So discovery is part of how we got to this. Second piece is taxonomy. So think here, right, navigation. Uh, think about how the personas might apply in terms of what, they're, what, it, what an individual is looking for in this phase. And what you really want to be focusing on here, you know, you've got what the API is supposed to do, so now you're digging in, what are going to be the method names, how are we going to name our resources, if they're going to access this API, what are the, the big level steps that they're going to go through? And for this, you want to start sitting down really with developers. Uh, one of the things that we did at Arity that we absolutely loved was, and I think they still do this today, is bringing developers in from across uh, different companies and interviewing them and talking with them and having them do this stuff. It's really helpful if you can get developers either you know, from a different company who have no idea what you're doing, or if not that, then at least from a completely different department where they're not familiar with your products in order to get them to give you this feedback. So the techniques we used here were things like card sorts and tree testing. Um, and I'll go into both of these in, in the examples. So for tree testing, right, the taxonomy, uh, 
we had this idea of a user, and we had all of these things that we want to connect to the user, right? So birth, place, and age, and whether they're an iPhone user or an Android user, and whether they've got pets, and we were trying to build up this very big, dynamic, detailed picture of what a user is. And we had a whole bunch of departments who, and a whole bunch of functions who all wanted to add more stuff in here. And so we were like, okay, great, we'll create the user, and then we're gonna just attach everything to this user. And it'll be, it'll be no problem. Like, you know, we can just throw whatever we want into that table and into that API, and it's gonna go smoothly. And as we started to ask people, like, which of these things belong together, what we learned was that there were frameworks in our developers' heads that were based on, you know, what actually belongs. We found out that birthplace and age are things that don't change, and attaching those to the users was really easy. Things like a pet, that changes, per, you know, that can change with some frequency. People get new pets, they, they lose old ones. And so attaching that at the same level wasn't driving for people. And so we started to realize that, okay, maybe we actually need to, you know, separate these things out, put them in different places. We started, we learned what goes together, what doesn't go together. The other thing, though, is that we were trying to figure out what do we call all of these things, right? Because this is that other piece of taxonomy of like, how do you, what do you call things and how do you, how do you structure around them? And so we, you know, as we were doing discovery for this, as we were talking to you, we said, oh, what characteristics do you need to attach to a user? And everybody's like, characteristics? And we're like, oh, I guess not characteristics, attributes. Yeah, attributes. What attributes do you need to attach to a user? And everybody's like, Jenny, we have no idea what you're talking about. We tried a lot of different things here. Um, and we, we were doing polls, and we were doing votes, and we were like, everything on earth. And it turns out that sometimes, when you're building really abstract concepts like this, you find a place where you're, you make a note, like, the API can't do this alone. We need to rely on our docs here. There was no word that was ever going to describe the things that we wanted to have here that was not going to be vague and abstract. And so we found that instead we needed to make a plan for actually explaining it in a very different way to our customers. So these are some of the things that came out of our taxonomy explorations. The other thing that I love doing with taxonomy is the card sort. And this is where index cards are your friends. So Ben here uh, has every single verb plus method on an index card in front of him. And we passed him this pile of index cards and we said, read these through and let us know, first off, what does our API do? If, you're de if a developer can't look just at how you've named things and what you have presented to them and tell you a guess at what your API is doing, you probably don't have things named very clearly. So that's the first thing. The second thing was that we said, now let's go through each of these endpoints, right? Each of, and what is, what is exactly the, what is the thing that this endpoint can do? And what order might you start calling these in? What's the order of operations? Which ones are simple and which ones are complex? And we got his feedback with all of these index cards as he starts ordering them and grouping them together. And it really told us a lot about how he thought our API would work based on how we had named things. Right, so back again to making it so that the developer can navigate through your APIs. We all know they don't actually read the documentation until they're stuck. So if you can make it so that the names are really clear, it reduces the need for documentation by quite a bit. The other glorious thing about putting this on an index card is that when he got stuck on something, I'd take the index card away, I'd write a new one, I'd pass it back to him, I'd be like, how about now? And so we could iterate at the table together super quickly to figure out what was actually the thing we were trying to build and if we could get things right then and there. And so then when I took it to the next developer to test again, we had a much more refined product that we were presenting and it was all done with a Sharpie and a couple pieces of paper. Remember, at this point, we still have it. I haven't even picked up the word processor part, right? Like, this is still really, you know, it's really amazing the stuff you can do and as far as you can get without having to code a single line. So the third piece, mocking and prototyping, this is where you do need a word processor. Um, and if you have Slack or, you know, some sort of instant messenger program, that's like the next level up of high tech here. So this is where you're starting to now, you know, we've got our methods, we've got our resources, we've got our high level structure for our API. We now want to start digging into those request and response bodies. 
So we want to get an outline of each endpoint. We don't need to have every single thing finalized. We don't need to know what headers. We don't need to know what our auth is. But we want to know what's the content within each of these. And so here, there's two techniques that I love. One is paper prototypes, and the other is instant messenger APIs. So the, the techniques we're going to talk about in a second can apply to either of these. Um, but the difference really, a paper prototype is where you have your API typed up on some sheets of paper, and you literally pass them to somebody, and you say, can I have some edits, please? And you let them go to town with that red, with that red pen, right, and, and be the, you know, the critical English teacher, and they can rip your API apart, and it's just sheets of paper, and they're just gonna go through and, what's this, I don't get this, can you move this over here, why is this, and they're just gonna write everything out, and it works fantastically to get that feedback. Uh, the other one is instant messenger APIs. And this one is a, takes a little bit more of a, a quick-witted uh, developer on your team in order to support this. But essentially what you do is you have the developer who is giving you feedback in a room with a moderator. And you put them in front of Slack or some other instant messenger program. In the other room, you have a developer from your team. And you pass this first developer your pile of, of uh, index cards, and maybe a little bit more guidelines, but still pretty vague. And you say, what are some of the, like, what would be the things you'd request with this endpoint? And so you have them type in, like, get users and wait. And then on the other side, you have the developer who's madly in the other room trying to type up, or maybe they've got some outlines already, you know, they do the get users and they have the thing that copy pasted in, like, okay, here's your response. And, and then they're like, okay, so then, you know, like, here's this stuff, and then they're like, okay, so now I want to, you know, I'm going to call this one, and I'm going to, you know, patch over this, you know, these inf this information. And they send it in, and the other developers in the room, instant messenger, right, typing back the API. So it's a little slow, but it's a great way to get this additional feedback of, like, what does, the de what does your customer actually think in their head is going to happen with each of these endpoints? What are the details that they're looking for? Um, so both of these are really cool, and, and the things you're looking for, right, are um, those details. So Weather Underground is both one of my favorite APIs, and it drives me absolutely insane. Um, and I've shortened what their get forecast is here, but it's the get forecast for London. Um, and so I've sort of done an example here, right? <coughs> Period three title, focus text, focus text metric and precipitation, and that's, that's the forecast. And so, you know, you hand this over to somebody and they're gonna be like, well, first off, I don't know what period three means in this case, right? Uh, the title Wednesday night makes a lot more sense, so, you know, at least in the documentation, if you could lead with that, then I can know what I'm looking at. Uh, precipitation is zero, is that percent? Is that inches? Is that centimeters? I don't really have a clue. Uh, Finally, I figured out FCT means forecast. Uh, so it's forecast text. Um, but only one of them is tagged with the units of metric. Imperial is not tagged with imperial. And these are the sorts of things where you put this in front of, of a person, and they're going to ask all of these questions, and they're going to give you these edits. And you're going to be able to really understand a lot more about what they're looking for, and be able to also hear, there's going to be times where you, know, you can do docs right by having, you know, if they spell that forecast, it might solve a lot of problems here, but then there's also things where, like, you know, they could have the precipitation being in units, but maybe a period is something where it just has to be there, and that's where the docs come in, and you need to supplement your information. Um, with the paper prototypes, the other important thing to remember is ugly is beautiful. Uh, the <clears throat> when you present something to somebody where they think that you put a lot of time into it, they're not going to want to rip it apart because they're not going to want to hurt your feelings. So make it ugly, because then they won't know how much time you spent on it, and they'll feel much more comfortable telling you how much they hate it. <laughs> and finally, we get into usability, right? The good news is getting all of that feedback means that you can create such a better product. And so with usability, you're now at the point where you're actually mocking up your APIs. Um, you want to have things stopped out, uh, and you want to really uh, use your traditional usability practices again here for making sure that things can be done. So you want to have a moderator guide. 
you want to make sure that the details are there, that all of the content is there and it looks real, um, but you still don't want to have to make it that real. So this is, you know, Postman and Swagger were really great at this point, right? Because you're trying to get the developer to feel like they're calling a real API and understand what's going on. And some of the things you might put in a mod guide for usability are things like, you know, hey, can you charge a credit card for $12.50 if we're doing a payments API? Uh, you can say, hey, can you give a 10% discount for everybody who uses API the docs as their promo code? Or can you, you know, create a pricing chart? Let me know how much lattes, cappuccinos, and mochas are at this restaurant. Uh, if you are able to have the developer successfully do these things without help, then you know you've got a very usable API. If you can't get them to do this stuff, maybe you go back, you edit the API, but maybe this is the point where you say, that's just something we have to acknowledge, we're gonna have to supplement in the docs. But this gives you a really good sense of what you actually need additional detail on and where you have a product that can stand on its own. Uh, one of the things I love to do with this is when the developer comes in, I'll put her at the chair with the screen right behind her, and then I'll just use the computer to record. And so what happens then is you, you can sit on one side of the table, you're watching her, you can see her screen, but she doesn't feel that self-consciousness of having to like make, you know, feel like every single step she's doing is being, is being uh, monitored. And the other nice piece of this is then you can just, since you only have the, you can only use the one camera and you record and you get the screen and her face and the whole thing. So when she goes, ah, you can then, you know, capture that moment in her face and have it be a lot more robust than just the audio. So the wonderful thing is once you finish all this testing, if you now pass the stuff off to your engineers to build it, it's going to be so much clearer, it's going to be so much easier to use than if you tried to start, you know, and just build, jump in and build stuff at the beginning. It's not a lot of investment. But we're all here as developers who presumably don't have the best, you know, we're not all starting from scratch on every API. Uh, if we were, we'd probably have a lot fewer people in this room because we'd need a lot fewer docs. Um, with APIs that are live today, it's a, it's, it's a trickier it's a trickier thing, right? Uh, but the most important thing to do is to start with the assessment. And this is where you actually can start at the, back, at the far end with the usability study. So back to that charge them for $12.50. If you start with that step and see if they can do that or not, then you find all the holes in your API and in your documentation. You can then create a vision for where you want to be. And then you can figure out what your strategy is going to be around version. Um, but don't let the fact that the API is already built to mean that you don't ever make any changes ever again. There's all sorts of things you can do and all sorts of tricks. Now. Take tips and tricks. So one of the favorites for me is that back at Arity, we had this API uh, that was get reports. And the first thing you had to do was specify the type, whether it was a periodic or a summary or a histogram. And the doc said, if periodic, please provide these things, but you don't need to provide that. And if summary, please provide these things, but not that. And if you supply an end date, then it's not going to work, so don't add the end date. And if you are looking for a histogram, we need these things and this, but not this. And it was like following one of those little tree charts um, to just make a call for a get. And so we decided that we were gonna hide this with our documentation in one API wrapper. So we created get reports slash periodic. And our docs just said, you know, give us the start date, the end date, the start time, the end time, interval length, and the units. And that was it. Um, and there was no if this, then that. And all we did was when they called this endpoint, we put a wrapper on it. And the nice thing about the reports, we didn't care to, you know, we couldn't afford the extra couple seconds of latency. We would just insert for them when they called that endpoint, type is periodic. So we didn't have to do anything to break backwards compatibility. And we cleared up this huge piece of confusion for our customers just through a wrapper um, and simplifying out our docs. So there's all sorts of things you can do, even with existing APIs, co combining docs and good design that can really simplify and improve the process. But if you don't start with a good UX discoverability uh, and usability system, you're never going to know where the issues are. And so you don't know where to begin. I know you guys are all hungry. Thank you so much. Uh, if I'll be around during the break. And you can always tweet at me at Jenny Dove. <laughs>